This program is being videotaped on November the 11th, 1993 in the Kenneth K. King studio at the corporate office of Goodwill Industries of America Incorporated in Bethesda, Maryland. Our two program participants are Frank Flegel and Bob Watkins, both members of Goodwill Industries Hall of Fame. The first question which I will direct to Frank is, who are you, Frank? Tell us about your background and your Goodwill Industries service record. I, ca <clears throat> I came into Goodwill Industries in 1933, uh, actually right out of college. My major at that time was business administration. I came into the Oakland Goodwill and uh, uh, served for one year as char in charge of their uh, financial affairs, the business office, the payroll, and so on. I served 21 years in Oakland and then was offered the chance to go to Los Angeles. And I moved to Los Angeles with the family, of course, in 1953, served 22 years, and retired from the Los Angeles Goodwill in 1976. So every 21 or 22 years, I changed positions. A follow-up question for you, Frank, in relationship to your Goodwill service is what uh, do you want to be remembered for? What historic event in your leadership as an executive or when people talk about Frank Flegel in the future, what do you want them to think about when they hear the word and the name Frank Flegel? Uh, I, I think maybe there are two or three uh, things I would suggest, Cecil, in addition to the fact that uh, I worked hard and did a good job. I'd like to be remembered for that. But uh, one of the things that I think I had a great deal to do with was the development of our accreditation program. Uh, P.J. Trevathan uh, was anxious to develop a self-accreditation program within Goodwill because he sensed that one was coming for the movement nationally, for the sheltered workshop movement. And I was chairman of that committee. We worked diligently, spent two or three years developing a formula and did some self-testing within the Goodwill movement. And I believe if our document were laid side by side with the first documents of the what is now CARF, you'd find that they borrowed greatly from our Goodwill program at that point. I think another thing that I am proud to have had some part in is the development of what is now our Conference of Executives because there was a period of several years when there was a switching back and forth as to the impact of the local Goodwill Executive Group on or as members of the National Board. And out of that came what is now the Conference of Executives. If I could add a third one, briefly, I was on the selection committee which selected our present National Executive Admiral David Cooney. Thank you. Bob, who are you? And uh, tell us something about your service record uh, with Goodwill Industries. I came on to Goodwill Industries rather as a fill-in. I happened to be in the office of a district superintendent of Dayton, Ohio, uh, Methodist ch church area, and the superintendent of Goodwill was in there. I'd known him. And he said, are you busy, Bob, these days? And I said, no, as a matter of fact, the work that I was doing for WLW down at Cincinnati has been discontinued. And he said, well, you have some accounting. Would you come in and do some work for me here at the Dayton Goodwill? And I said, probably. And he said, I can't pay you much. I'll pay you $10 a week, and that'll be enough for your bus fare and your lunch. And if you'll take that on for a while until my present accountant gets recovered, that'll be fine. Well, the accountant had cancer and she never did recover. Later, um, Nash asked me if I would be the superintendent of the plant and I asked if I could also have the store since I'd had a course in merchandising in the University of Cincinnati. So he said, sure, that's fine. Along in April of 1936, 
Dr. Helms came and he interviewed me and he said that he'd be glad for me to consider Goodwill as the future because they were especially looking for people that had a business background. To make that part rather brief, I was trained in Milwaukee that summer under Oliver Friedman and on September the 1st of 1936 I was hired as a Dayton Goodwill executive. We had some very successful years there and um, I was there until 1950 then I was invited to go to Los Angeles and we were there from 50 to early to the end of 53. I went back to the city of Dayton with the city government but was fortunate enough to be elected to the Dayton Goodwill Board and after a, a, about two and a half years there Trevethan invited me to come on the National Goodwill staff. I had four primary, primary responsibilities here and finally was elevated to the assistant CEO job and became the executive in 1966. I held that position for six years and decided that I would like to try to raise enough money to endow the training program for instance and I wasn't successful in raising that much but I did continue for two more years and retired in 1974. Since that, I've done considerable consulting work for the Goodwill Industries of America and for the federal government at least up until about 10 years ago. And recently, I've been with the help of Karen and other folks here, been able to edit the uh, alumni paper and I believe that brings me pretty well up to date. I also have been fortunate to be on the Hall of Fame Selection Committee. One last thing as you're talking, uh, the same question I asked Frank, what do you want to be remembered for, Bob, by people in the future as they watch this tape, as they hear the word uh, Bob Watkins, and are aware of who you are and that you were the Chief Executive Officer here, and you served in local goodwill, and you are a member of the Hall of Fame. What specific uh, things in your life do you want people to remember you for? Well, of course, I'm very proud of my family, but from a career standpoint, I would like to be remembered as having a concern for handicapped people, that I was fortunate to be able to expand the operation of uh, certain goodwills, especially the Dayton Goodwill, into pr bringing in contract work for the first time. From a national stand, uh, at Los Angeles, we did do some unique things. One was to enter a float in the Pasadena Rose Parade in 1952, which was the 50th anniversary of Goodwill Industries of America. As far as uh, the national office is concerned, I was very proud of the fact that we acquired this property, that we established the training and recruiting program as a division of the national uh, staff and we created a number of other new units throughout the nation. Thank you. Most of us uh, never had the opportunity of knowing the founder of Goodwill Industries, Edgar J. Helms, and some of the other people who have already uh, left our uh, life and world and and so I'd like for take a few minutes and have each of you describe the personality and perhaps the management style of some of our pioneers. Uh, Frank, uh, did you know uh, Dr. Helms? I met Dr. Helms uh, only uh, uh, casually and uh, just a, a few times as a young executive. Uh, he visited uh, Oakland Goodwill uh, early on in my career uh, and uh, I, I did not have any close or direct uh, 
contact with Dr. Helms. I'll defer to Bob on that. I think he's probably had a little more than I have. The one thing that I can comment about Dr. Helms, when he visited Oakland, talked to Helen, my wife at that time, we had just been married shortly, and he scared us to death with a suggestion that uh, we should consider going to Australia and uh, starting a goodwill there. I found out later he suggested that to almost every new executive uh, <laughs> as they came along, but at the moment it was a very frightening uh, thought to us. Just uh, while I'm still talking with you, uh, and I, I will ask Bob the, about Edgar Helms, but uh, did you know Oliver Friedman at all? Oliver Friedman I knew, and uh, I had some um, closer contact with Oliver. And uh, he was, uh, I think, without much doubt, the individual who brought order out of the embryonic goodwill movement at that time. Up until then, uh, obviously, uh, the goodwill movement consisted of uh, what, 35 or 40 uh, individual local units around the country. And they were all proud of their local autonomy, uh, convinced that they were doing uh, it the only way it should be done and hammering away at each other to follow that pattern. Oliver reduced uh, the uh, procedures to written form. He was legalistic in that sense. He developed a, a, a earlier a blue book of uh, guidelines for the various departments of Goodwill Industries, and he worked tirelessly at that. Oliver did not have a, a dynamic personality in the sense of uh, other folks, P.J. Trevethan, for example, so uh, the movement did not necessarily respond to Oliver in the sense of a, uh, a, a leader that they followed, uh, but he, he had that impact on the movement, and for a number of years, and through the war years, uh, uh, Oliver was definitely a strong, uh, stable influence uh, on the whole Goodwill movement. I mean, while I'm talking with you, uh, give us your impressions of P.J. Trevethan, who was also one of the chief executive officers of our Goodwill movement. Fine, yeah. Uh, P.J. I knew, but tell us something about his personality and his management style, because we read about people in the Hall of Fame, and they're just wonderful pictures on the wall, and we sometimes wonder, just like uh, biblical characters, if these people were really human. Uh, tell us what you remember about P.J. Trevethan. P.J. Uh, uh, has a, a very special place uh, in, uh, in my heart. Uh, my dad and Dr. Fred Blair and P.J. Trevethan are the three people who had a, a definite impact on me as I came into the movement. And uh, because of those individuals, I stayed with the movement. I'm not saying I wouldn't have otherwise, but they certainly had the impact. P.J. was entirely different than Oliver Friedman. Uh, he was a warm, gregarious uh, kind of a person. Uh, he had uh, the knack of, uh, of inspiring the group. Uh, if you had a conference and PJ spoke uh, after four or five minutes, you were following PJ and, and he uh, had that characteristic. Uh, he uh, was a, uh, 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 an inspiration, I think, to the young executives. He had the uh, spiritual impact on the movement, if that's the proper way to say it, and uh, he, he, he brought a cohesiveness to the Goodwill family. I think perhaps more than uh, either Dr. Helms or uh, Oliver, uh, PJ uh, uh, encouraged the executives to be the movement. He, he relied on them, he asked their opinions, he formed committees of the leaders of the executive group, and uh, in a sense, uh, he uh, used their judgment to help him mold the movement from the time he became the national executive. Thank you, Bob. I know that you knew uh, Dr. Helms and perhaps uh, in a more personal way than Frank. Uh, take a couple of minutes and tell us about your impressions of Dr. Helms' personality and and management style. Well, Dr. Helms, of course, was a very inspirational character. He 
had the ability to mingle with very wealthy people and talk to them about the, the needs of the organization and in some instances was able to get a substantial amount of financial assistance from them. But he also was very able and willing and devoted most of his life to mingling with people that had very few privileges. He had the concept after visiting the Rochdale cooperatives in England that this movement should adopt the cooperative system and through that uh, America could be evangelized. In those days he was concerned mostly about the spiritual emphasis of goodwill and its possibilities as a, an instrument for evangelization. He had diabetes and took insulin and his personality sometimes went up or down depending upon how much he needed insulin. I remember when I first met him and he, he interviewed Charlotte and me about Goodwill Industries he pointed out the fact that uh, goodwill was not going to be an easy thing to do and furthermore since she was wearing a silk dress that would probably be the last silk dress she might get. Actually I don't think I'd bought her the silk dress because she had been teaching school before that and probably purchased her own but anyway whether she's had silk dresses since I'm not sure but she could probably verify that. The uh, he also suggested that we might get into training, but he couldn't pay us very much. He said, I'll pay you $15 a week if you'll take training up at Milwaukee. And we did that. And uh, from time to time, uh, he did some interesting things. Of course, he had this farm up at South Athol, Massachusetts. And I remember... Uh, they used to weigh all the underprivileged youngsters from Boston that they sent up there for two or three weeks in the summertime. Then they would weigh them when they went home and they could tell them how much weight they had gained because they were properly fed at South Athol. Another instance at South Athol that was done not by Helms personally but probably with his permission, they had a flock of chickens and the roosters fought each other all the time. So somebody got the bright idea that they could make miniature glasses for the roosters and so they came up with some little green grasses and put them on the bill of each one of those roosters that were fighting a lot and they had a very peaceful flock after that. Generally speaking, Helms had a great capacity to inspire people and to get things done and he especially during the Roosevelt administration he was in contact with uh, several people right under the president. All right, let me ask you just a couple of words about Oliver Friedman and P.J. Trebethan uh, because most of us did not uh, know Oliver Friedman. Uh, is there anything you can add to what Frank said about his uh, personality and, and management style? Well, Frank did a very good job of summarizing Oliver. He started actually in 1918. One of the f most significant things he did was to create a display of goodwill as he and Helms understood it at the time at Columbus, Ohio when the Methodists staged what they called the Centenary Movement. And as a result of that, they raised $50 million to get the world started back toward a peaceful settlement following World War I. And as you know, perhaps you don't know, but they set aside a million dollars for some promising new enterprise. And as a result of that, uh, Helms was able to get a million dollars to launch Goodwill Industries across the United States and subsequently around the world. By 1927, we had 27 different organizations going. Uh, Oliver started the Goodwill Industries at Buffalo. He operated that about two years and then went to Milwaukee and spent much of his career there. Uh, 
he was very interested in uh, management style was uh, along with uh, Frank Baker on the early uh, systems development committee that's not quite the right name but what they did was to devise uh, some plans for suggesting that Goodwill Industries use as guides for their operations. He put out the annual report for 25 years. He actually was the person instrumental in getting us into the rehabilitation movement. To Dr. Helm's credit, in 19, up till 1934, we'd been a work relief organization. Glenn Laybody, who was then at Buffalo, uh, wrote a letter to Helms saying we're, comp we're competing with the government. If we get into a phase of employment and services that the government is ignoring, we will not only be operating under a good plan, but we'll probably get government support and we believe that the rehabilitation and helping of disabled people is where we ought to go. And Helms recommended that that Friedman take this idea on, and I can tell you more about that later. Thank you. Let's uh, switch gears here. We've talked about the pioneers. We've talked about your background and your experience in Goodwill. I know because of the number of years that you served as local Goodwill executives and at the corporate office here, that many humorous incidents have occurred. Uh, I know that, that I've listened to Bob Watkins tell about some of the things in the bag uh, unusual, bizarre donations. Uh, let me start with you, Frank. Do you remember any incidents that is uh, that will not uh, frighten or shock anyone that you can tell us about of uh, humorous or uh, unusual donations that were that you're familiar with? Well, this is not exactly a donation, Cecil, but I do uh, remember as you asked the question. You know this flashes into my mind. In Los Angeles, uh, we had, uh, uh, as, a, as every goodwill, a great variety of uh, conditions represented in your working group. And uh, one of our fellows who had uh, great difficulty in uh, walking, uh, I don't recall the circumstances at the moment, but he showed up one day with a golf cart as his transportation. And he was tremendously proud of this thing and he drove it into the employee parking lot and uh, people gathered around and he had obviously solved his transportation problem. Well about two or three days later at closing time there was a big hullabaloo because somebody had stolen his golf cart out of the employee parking lot and his poor fellow was now again back on walking the few blocks to his home or whatever and uh, uh, so that was duly reported and uh, nobody had a clue the next morning the golf cart was back in the employee parking lot and so a little detective work discovered the individual who had stolen the night before, driven it home, and came back, another one of our Goodwill employees. The irony was that this Goodwill employee that had stolen the golf cart and driven home in it through the L.A. traffic was a fellow who used a white cane uh, to get around during the day at Goodwill. <laughs> so uh, that's what came to mind when you said humorous incident. Um, I uh, may think of something else in a moment or two. Bob, you were telling me the other day about an individual who claimed that he could sell anything. And that, uh, tell us a little bit about this gentleman of uh, goodwill who, and some of the uh, methods that he used to be able to, to live up to that uh, statement that anything that was donated he could sell. Well, his name was Hollingsworth, and he was down at uh, Norfolk, Virginia in those days. As a matter of fact, the whole thing was unique. 
it was his private enterprise in a way. He started it without a board of directors. He acquired the building, set the thing in operation. He didn't have any staff, and his system of paying people was to go to the cash register at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and as folks left, he paid them out of the day's receipts. And if they didn't have much money, they didn't get much pay. If they had a good day, they got more pay. But what you mentioned, at one point, he made an offer to the public that he could sell anything they would send. So he got some rather interesting articles. One was a skeleton from some source, probably a hospital or something, and he sold that one for $10. And he got a bucket full of tadpoles. Well, he put them in the window and he said, watch the tadpoles turn into frogs, two for a nickel. Nobody was buying tadpoles. Then he got the idea that maybe if he did it in Latin or something like that. So he looked up the Latin phrases for tadpoles and frogs and it had a long, two long words and he put these on a big sign and put that in the window and people lined up for that. It looked like they were lined up for stockings during World War II. And actually, he was sitting in the church on Sunday morning and the, a lady came down and tapped him on the shoulder and she said, Mr. Hollingsworth, I've got to have those last two things out of your window. My, this is my grandson's birthday and I know he'll be excited to see what happens. And so he got up out of church and went down and sold his last two tadpoles for five, uh, for five cents and cleared that out. Another thing that was uh, sort of interesting, he got uh, uh, quite a quantity of appendix from one of the physicians. Most folks have more appendix than they know what to do with, and so when he put these on sale in his store, there was very little demand. In fact, the demand was zero. But he got on a great idea that did sell them. He called a friend of his who was in the Isaac Walton League and he sold the appendix for fish bait. Another thing he got was quite a quantity of used false teeth from one of the dental clinics. And I said to him one day, Hollingsworth, did you really move them? And he says, oh yes, they went very well. He set up the most, the only, as far as I know, the only false tooth resale and rental service that's ever been established in Goodwill Industries. But for two dollars a week, you could rent a set of false teeth if, if you could f find some that fit. And many did, apparently, and I said, what do people do with them mostly, especially the rentals? And he said, well, they rent them, and they're going to a camp meeting, and after they come back, they can turn them in. But he said, frequently, if the two teeth have been satisfactory all during the camp meeting, they'll buy the whole thing. So that's a, one illustration of a different kind of an executive. <laughs> Let's go back just a minute after... Uh, We've discussed uh, everything from tadpoles to chicken with spectacles uh, and find out a little bit about uh, uh, how you became a Goodwill executive. Frank, uh, tell us something about just briefly, uh, I know that you have a family connection with Goodwill, but who influenced you most? You've mentioned it already. And uh, what motivated you to become a Goodwill executive, and of course, then after you became an executive, you served for many years. But what was the motivating factor in your life? Well, uh, my my dad was the executive uh, of the Goodwill Industries in uh, Northern California, which at that time was uh, San Francisco with its branch operations around the Bay Area, Oakland, San Jose, Stockton, etc. I was in high school, and every so often on a Saturday morning, I would get impressed into serving as a truck helper uh, when they needed someone to go along with the trucks in San Francisco. So that was actually my start in Goodwill. I don't get credit for starting in 1926, but that's when I did. Uh, in 1933, I was graduating from college, University of California at Berkeley. My major had been business administration. I had a minor in psychology. And the job market in 1933 was pretty bleak. And as we approached the end of the semester, and I had applied here and there, it became clear that uh, nobody was clamoring for my services. At that point, the Goodwill in San Francisco 
uh, had reached an agreement where the Goodwill Industries in Oakland, a branch up to that time, was to become locally autonomous July 1 of 1933. The arrangement also was that my dad would move over and become the executive of the, move over across the San Francisco Bay, and become executive of the new Goodwill in Oakland, and Monroe Hess, who was in Baltimore at that time, come out and become the executive in San Francisco. And uh, about a month before I was to graduate, my dad said to me, why don't you uh, come with me in Oakland and you take uh, the responsibility for setting up all of the uh, uh, financial requirements inside. You, d you do the payroll and the reports and whatever and let me free to do the public relations fundraising in the community. I said, well, that sounds interesting. Let's think about it. He said, if you decide to do it, only one stipulation. You must stay at least a year. After that, you're free to do whatever you want to do. So I did. I went with uh, the Oakland Goodwill in that capacity for a year. After that, I did what I wanted to do, which was 42 more years in Goodwill Industries. That's how I got into Goodwill. I have to say this, once in it, I had never uh, any feeling that I can recall that I wanted to do something else. It happened to be something that just seemed to fit, feel perfectly fine with me. Part of it was my dad's influence, I'm sure. Early on, probably in that first year, I'm not exactly sure now, uh, they found a, a training stipend, $50 it was at that time, and I was able to spend a month in Los Angeles under Dr. Fred Blair. Fred Blair was a marvelous man. Uh, he's in the Hall of Fame where he richly deserves to be, but he was an absolute gentle man, but a very brave man, and uh, his influence uh, at, in those years was, was felt up and down the Pacific Coast, from Canada to San Diego, no question about that. And then early on I was fortunate enough to meet Dr. P.J. Trevethan, and P.J. just um, solidified uh, my feeling that Goodwill's where I belong. So those three men, I would give that credit. Uh, Oakland became quite a challenging thing. I worked with my dad as his assistant for a number of years, and I was selected to be the executive when he retired in 1949. I worked 21 years in Oakland, then moved to L.A. to try to repair the damage Bob Watkins had done to the L.A. program. <laughs> Now, I have to mention here that, that we determined not to have any body blows in this oh, uh, program. Oh, I take that back, Robert. Yes. Any uh, insults or yeah. carrying on uh, I'd forgotten in, that, in, yes. in front of the camera. I would like to say that Frank did have kinder days. One time at a public meeting, he stood before the whole delegate assembly and said that he had succeeded me at Los Angeles and everything was in fine shape. And he was very grateful for that. And I was, too, because at that time, I was trying to locate people and I found almost no new executives that didn't downplay the, their predecessors. <laughs> Bob, uh, following that same train of thought, you've given us a little bit of background of how you came with Goodwill. Would you like to add anything else about uh, why you selected Goodwill and who motivated or influenced you in the very beginning back in the 30s? Well, from the primary interview, uh, Dr. Helms made considerable impact upon me and then he suggested that I train in Milwaukee so it was my good fortune to be under Oliver Friedman who both of us have indicated was the person that primarily swung us over from a work relief program to a rehabilitation program and I was in training there for for two months, that seems like it was a rather brief training, but it was a very good experience for me. And I want to say this, I want to say about Oliver as far as rehab is concerned. Uh, he, when he was asked by Helms to do something about uh, the letter that Glenn Laybody had sent suggesting we work with disabled people, that uh, within the year of 1935, he was elected to the Committee of Six under the federal government following the uh, National Recovery Act code, also the Federation of Women's Clubs nationally, 
decided that they needed a representative for rehabilitation and Oliver is put on that and he was also onto the council of, of a new organization called the National Council for the Handicapped. So that was our first recognition as to being in the rehabilitation business on anything like a national scope. So it was my good fortune, or unique opportunity in many ways, to be recruited by Helms, trained by Friedman, hired on the national staff by Trevethan. So in many ways this was a great opportunity for me and I hope that I've been able to carry on in some satisfactory way. Thank you. I want us to now to think about uh, dramatic changes since the 1930s to the 1990s. Uh, I've asked you before the program to start thinking about uh, things that you believe that have dramatically changed. All of us know that the simplicity of the Goodwill Movement is the uh, collection of donated goods, the processing of them, the sale of them to provide vocational rehabilitation services for people with disabilities. But each and every generation has brought about a different uh, method of doing that. So Frank, uh, have you in your observance of goodwill for these past 60 years, uh, what dramatic changes have you seen and any comments about that? I think the most uh, single, most dramatic change, Cecil, in, in my experience, in my judgment, would be the uh, physical conditions in which Goodwills operate. Uh, in the early days, there were no uh, uh, facilities that begin to uh, resemble today's modern facilities in the slightest. In fact, in this, Frank, many of us started in old churches. Yes. Yes, uh, the, the, the local goodwill started uh, wherever it could in the local community. It might have been an abandoned church, uh, a warehouse that uh, somebody uh, was not rented and, and the owner would say to goodwill, well, you can use this for a dollar a year, uh, or they just uh, scratched their way into uh, any kind of a facility, but not only was the facility not modern in that sense, the operating conditions were such that today you could not possibly operate as you did in those days and get by without being put out of business within 30 days. And I'm referring to such things as uh, uh, health and occupational, what's it, OSHA, occupational safety and health uh, things, uh, inspections, uh, environmental. Uh, the, the conditions in which the goodwill started were simply um, primitive, absolutely primitive. And uh, in most cases, within my awareness, uh, they were uh, situations such as Bob has mentioned, abandoned churches, warehouses, whatever. You started wherever you get a foothold. And uh, the, the things that you did in those days, for instance, one of the things that we did, and which I don't think you could begin to do nowadays, was sort broken glass. <laughs> you, uh, we would collect glass, uh, then you would uh, set up an area in your, in your yard or in the building where you would sort the glass by color, clear, green, and brown. Then you would give some guy who needed a pair of shoes a chance to work two or three hours sorting broken glass. And what he, the, the tools he was equipped with was a hammer and a big metal wash tub. And so this is a pile of white medicine bottles, break them into this. Here's some green bottles, break them into this. And uh, we didn't think of furnishing safety goggles. It didn't occur to anybody. Your insurance carriers today would die of fright if you suggested doing that kind of an activity. Those, I think, are the most dramatic changes that I can uh, uh, call up at the moment. The other change, of course, is in the entire approach to dealing with the individual. Uh, the individual in the early days would present himself and he obviously needed something, a pair of shoes, shirt, whatever, and, uh, or a meal ticket. And uh, Goodwill would, would try to provide that for that individual at that moment. 
nowadays, of course, you have your whole evaluation uh, process. You recruit uh, resources uh, from other agencies in the community, and you do a much more sophisticated uh, evaluation uh, development of a, of a uh, program uh, of training and so on. Uh, those two things are the first things that come to my mind. Bob, can you think of any other uh, dramatic changes that have occurred in the last 60 years? Well, of course, the service to people, as Frank has indicated, is a, a very prominent change. We were, as I've indicated earlier, a work relief organization up until 1934, and this continued up until 1939. In our annual reports, we... Uh, listed figures indicating how much uh, financial value was paid out in wages or merchandise in kind to people who were on the work relief program. But one great virtue of the Goodwill Industries it's, has been its uh, built willingness to adjust to the times. After Oliver Friedman got us into the services to physically disabled and by the way uh, he did hire an occupational therapist on his staff in 1936 so from a professional standpoint he got started pretty early but for uh, through the rest of the 30s and into the 40s when Walter Logue established the first uh, comprehensive rehabilitation program at the Chicago Goodwill in 19 46. Uh, we were working primarily with physically impaired. When President Kennedy came on, because the, one of the members of his family were mentally involved, he had quite an interest in that, and the Goodwill Industries placed considerable emphasis upon serving the mentally impaired. In fact, we conducted a workshop at one point to, on how you get physically impaired people to work with mentally impaired people without slowing down the production process because, as a rule, mentally impaired people don't work as fast as physically impaired people when they're properly trained. And then, uh, more recently, as I understand it, the program has gone sort of into the area of helping uh, people dismissed from prisons and other types of what they call social handicaps. Very good. So you've covered the gamut from uh, uh, facilities to service to people with disabilities that have been somewhat dramatically changed in the last 60 years, but the uh, same purpose of serving people. Uh, let's talk about the future. We've talked about the past, and we're all living in the present. But I want you to th say for just a couple of minutes each what you see as the future vision of Goodwill Industries International, which we will become on January the 1st, 1994. Frank? Well... <coughs> Cecil, uh, predicting the future at this uh, point, you know, is, uh, uh, is uh, <laughs> not only difficult, probably impossible. Uh, all you can do, it seems to me, is to stand where we are and uh, look back at where we've been and say, can you imagine that much change and that variety of change the same period in the future? And it, it boggles your mind. It literally boggles your mind. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, has happened that we probably would not have predicted to the degree that it has happened, certainly, is the international movement. In the earlier days, uh, there were people like Jerry Clore, uh, and I, I can't give you other names, really, who carried the banner for the international movement. And, and they were just voices crying in the wilderness. Nobody paid much attention. They had no dollars to work with and uh, uh, no national staff uh, uh, aimed in that direction. And now we have an, an international movement that has terrific impact, uh, broad scope, uh, some financial backing, and a great deal of interest throughout the goodwill movement. So if you want to use that as one 
building block, you'd have to say the, the future certainly is going to find goodwill or modified programs uh, saturating uh, perhaps you'd call it the rest of the world. And when I say modified programs, I say that deliberately because goodwill as we operate it within this country simply cannot uh, operate in that same way in some other countries. The simplest example I can think of is uh, 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 looking for a volume of household discards in a community like uh, Haiti or India. Uh, the, the, what what they have on their backs is all there is, and you're not going to get usable discards, so you've got to modify your approach uh, to uh, find some other way to help the people we call disabled or disadvantaged within those cultures, within those communities. I think, uh, I think that uh, uh, funding is another uh, area where the future is um, expanding. Again, if we were to drive a stake or draw a line where goodwill movement was 60 years ago. You had almost zero funding outside of what you could create from processing discarded materials. Almost zero funding. And now, uh, I don't know what the current statistics are, but uh, uh, percentage-wise in the local budgets and in the national budget, there's a great deal of funding available from other sources for adjunct programs, not necessarily for processing discards, but for the other services that you try to provide. And I think that's another building block that in the future is a real challenge to the uh, executive group uh, tapping these sources or resources in the future. Bob, what vision do you have or see for Goodwill Industries International in the future? Well, Frank has laid out quite a substantial number of objects and targets from a client standpoint. I imagine that there are going to be opportunities and probably are tremendous uh, demands now that people be served who are victims of the various violence that takes place in all of our cities. I also feel that in the rehabilitation of persons, people who have organ implants or transplants or various other substitutes, they're going to need some specialized types of training that we have not yet experienced. Frank mentioned the International had a low rating years ago. I remember the Booz Allen Hamilton report back about 1968 or 69. They asked local units what they preferred as far as the uh, top type of service needed and the most uh, least needed and out of the whole list of units international was last I think they were I think it was considered 18th well that's certainly not true at the present time so from an organizational standpoint I think the international is going to be a great challenge of course we still haven't come up with a very good solution to serve handicapped or disabled people in the rural areas most of the time we do our best work in I would say medium-sized cities I don't believe we are as good at it in such areas as New York and Chicago and Los Angeles as we are in places like uh, Nashville and cities of that size. We're coming to the last question. This is your opportunity to look into the camera and give advice to chief executive officers of local goodwills. These may be people who have served for a number of years. It may be people who have just come to Goodwill, either through the executive training program or from outside of Goodwill. But with your vast experience and your knowledge and being a member of the Hall of Fame, you know what it's like to deal with staff, board, and community. And so, Frank, tell us and tell the executives exactly how they should do it. Tell them and give them advice right. from you. Well, Cecil, I think uh, 
Um, if I were to uh, talk to a, a person entering the executive group nowadays, uh, young or otherwise, coming in from some other resource, I, I would say uh, consider your board of directors in the local community as an asset, as a tool to be used just as much as your buildings, your equipment, your staff, your finances, <coughs> within a local community, if the executive thinks of the board as a tool for his use, you can do great things. Uh, they will open doors that you cannot open as, a, as an individual. Uh, if you need to get uh, to people in high places in your community, the way to get to them is through your board of directors. If you can't do this, you have the wrong board to begin with. You should recruit and uh, hopefully uh, you'll have a, uh, an influence in recruiting. I don't suggest you can uh, elect your own board, but you certainly should see that uh, you get a broad diversification of the leadership in the community and use it. The next thing I would say to a local executive is know your local program. Walk the plant. Walk it uh, daily, depending on the size of the plant, two or three times a week if it's a large one, but stand up every so often, say to your secretary, I'm walking the plant, call me if you need me, and walk down into the bowels of the organization and find out what the workers are doing down there, learn their first names, and get to where you feel comfortable and they feel comfortable with you. Third thing I would suggest, I may not leave anything for Bob here, <laughs> that's all right, uh, you hire the best people you can find for your staff. Hire better people than you are if possible and uh, uh, then work with the staff to accomplish what you think are the goals of the organization. Uh, you cannot do it all yourself and you've got to use these kinds of uh, resources to accomplish uh, your goals. Bob, what advice would you give to present executives are those coming through the executive training program to be chief executive officers? Well, for having served on the national staff for 18 years and offered advice and found so few people took it, <laughs> I am a little reluctant to set forth any great principles, but Frank has mentioned uh, several of the important ones. Uh, one that I would say in relation to the board, after you recruited quality board, then you keep them informed of what's going on at the place, especially the bad news. Hmm. Many, many execs have followed the policy of only reporting, especially to the president, the good news of things that have happened. But the bad news had better get there pretty soon also, because sooner or later it's going to crop up in a meeting, <coughs> and the president's <coughs> going to say, why didn't you tell me about Absolutely. that, Frank? You bet. Well, of course, Frank did tell them all the bad news, but... Uh, <laughs> Tried to keep that to a minimum. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, I feel that um, an executive must conduct himself in uh, such a manner that the corporation will be proud of whatever he does at any given time. Sometimes when we're away, we... Uh, think that we can say whatever we want to say or do whatever we want to do because it's not connected with our work. But for when I was with the city of Dayton a number of years ago, our treasurer said, if you hold a high office in any given organization, the color of office follows you. If you're the CEO, no matter what you say, as an individual, you think you're speaking as an individual and a family person, but somebody else knows you're the chief executive of uh, Goodwill Industries, they say, well, the Goodwill Industries philosophy must be so-and-so because I heard the president say this the other day. Or they must be very tolerant about certain things because I saw the executive do this. He went out and bought a Mercedes. And I'm not sure that a philanthropic organization should be headed by a man that insists that he needs to ride in the Mercedes. There are probably other areas, but uh, one is uh, exercise a certain amount of humility and certainly employ good staff. It's important when you employ a staff person that you get 
individuals that are better in that particular in the particular area of their specialty than you are if you both know the same then there's no point in having two people around so get subordinates that really know what they're all about and are willing to carry on the work that's assigned I want to thank both of you you have given us a, a new insight into some of the pioneers of goodwill you certainly have helped us to get to know each of you better we've looked at the past of goodwill we've looked at the vision for the future I ended up with advice that I think is not only appropriate but usable and doable by every executive we thank you for being participants in this program I am Cecil McFarland, Director of Membership Development and Support Division for Goodwill Interests of America. We appreciate you coming and sharing these thoughts with us. Thank you, Cecil. Our privilege. Thank you.